Well, our beams are complete, and the fact that they're real white oak makes me really happy. The so last time we left off in this process, we had our side pieces on and we were squeezing the cups out of those using PL and finish nails. So we left off with that and we also left off joining our long caps that would go on the bottom. So since then, obviously we got our caps on and the way we did this, we were able to squirt PL on the miters of our side pieces and that really worked because we didn't have to fight a wood glue and try to fight with the curing time because there's no way we would have beat the curing time. So doing it with the PL really made a big difference because it takes a while to cure and it's not drippy, it's not a liquid, it's more of a you know an adhesive rather than a glue. So that worked so good and we didn't have to get it on our hands. So then we just lifted our bottom cap of the beam in place and kind of compressed that adhesive and shot it with finish nails and our blocking locations. So I gotta tell you guys, these miters were not the best, but we ended up making them the best. And the reason they didn't line up in a lot of cases is because the cupping that we've been fighting this whole process. So the bottom cap of the beam that we just put on cupped like this. So we had our concave side down and when it joined up with the side piece, it was just like, oh man, some of these just weren't lining up. So we went and we went to Harbor Freight, got ourselves a belt sander for a hundred bucks and some 80 grit on that thing. And we just eased the edges, which we were gonna do anyways, because you know, these things look like, you know, factory, like a box. We didn't want that square edge. We want these to look like giant, white oak timbers so obviously with that look you're not going to have perfectly straight 90 edges so since we we're going for that look thankfully using that belt sander and just bringing the two materials together kind of floating them in and feathering it out it really worked to where we ended up with nice looking edges and that was the hardest part of this whole entire job was getting that bottom piece on and those miters to line up to the best that we can. I see a lot of beams that are not mitered like this. Uh, they're, just, they're just like in grain, edge grain, butt joints. I didn't, could not do that here. It's just too, like up here on the second floor, you see how close I am to this beam. I would not wanna see an in grain here. Like it would be horrible and by the way, look at this character right here in this beam. I mean the real white oak it is absolutely gorgeous. So yeah, and then look at this. Look at our corner here. Look at that edge right there. It just, these things came out so good. But once we got these things prepped, sanded to our liking, all the glue out of them, sanded our seams, which by the way, look really good as well. Um, you can still see them, which is what I was talking about in previous video. Uh, but it's not bad. I'll show you a view from down there looking up. You can definitely see them, but I'm, I'm accepting it. I mean, I don't have a choice, but I, I think they're acceptable. So after that, you know, everything went together. It's all prepped. John put two coats of our Loba on top of these, and that's the same finish I use on the white oak door and on my flooring down here. It's a satin finish, so they look natural like that too. They're not real glossy or anything. So that brings me to the next thing in this process, and that is doing the WOTG, which stands for Windsor One Tongue and Groove. So here is that material we're gonna be installing. This is the Windsor One product. This is a tongue and groove, but this is milled out of a one by eight, which typically Windsor One Tongue and Groove, when you think of it, the WOTG, like the, the OG of their boards, is the five and a half inch, milled out of a one by six. I wanted to go with this bigger one because this room is so tall, and I feel like it just proportionally makes more sense. And this board right here, you can see, is reversible. It's got the beaded side on the bottom. I'll show you that, that beaded profile. And then the side that we're gonna be using is actually the non-face side. It's gonna be this back reversible part here. So, first thing we need to do is figure out where our joists are. And we've already done that, and they're represented by these two red chalk lines on the ceiling. And as you are probably thinking right now, this is gonna be crazy to install each individual board between the beams. Why did I do it this way? Why didn't I put the, the tongue and groove on the ceiling first and then push the beams up to that? That's, 
I'm wondering that right now too. No, I'm just kidding. There's there's really good reason behind it, and I'll talk to you more about that as we get our first boards going here. So you, you're gonna agree with me, trust me. This is gonna be tedious, but when, when we get to that point, you're gonna be like, oh, okay, I got you, I see what you're doing. So first thing we need to do, actually like second thing we need to do after we chalk our lines is we need to take our laser, measure from this wall to the far wall and divide this board up in, into that dimension. So we got like 219 or something and then I did my, my division with this, the face of this, which is six and seven eighths and that tells me I would have a small thin strip over there if I started with a full board here. So doing the math, I figure out I can have a three inch strip here and then when I get all the way over there, I'll have another three inch strip, which is what I want. I don't want a small thin piece over there. It just looks bad. So we'll start with our three inch board right here and we have already ripped this on the table saw earlier because we've already got prepped for this install. And we are also got prepped in a big way by cutting all of our individual boards down to 48 inches. We set up a stop block on the sliding table saw and we just cut all of them they were gonna need. And they all were ripped right to 48 inches. The reason we did that is because we knew that these, the space between each beam is less than 48. So here's a 48 inch piece. Boom, we got about an inch, inch and a half overhang on each side. So. We know these are all good. So we got the HKC 55, we actually already got it out. And if you guys don't know what this is, you've been missing out. I feel like I've been missing out my whole career not having this. This is an aftermarket dust bag. <laughs> We're gonna see if it works. Uh, but we have been using this on our job, on our work out there at the barn. And it's freaking phenomenal. Like, I, I'm telling you, I've hated Festool for so long, but this right, I ordered this for this job because we're gonna have compound cuts on all these cuts. You're like, dude, you're crazy. Yeah, I know, it's, it's pretty crazy. We're gonna be using this. This is a stair tread tool. So the way this works, if you're familiar with doing any kind of stair work, you got this, this will pivot and this will find exactly what angle your piece needs to be cut to. For my first piece, I'll get in here. And then I'm gonna go all the way to the wall. So I'll hit the wall. I can actually probably exaggerate this. So I'll, you'll see I'll hit the wall and then I'll push these out to my beams. So that tells me the exact angle right there. And then while it's in place, I'll tighten up some of these knobs like this. Boom. All right, so this, this setting right here is exactly the taper that I need in between these two beams. And you say, are you gonna taper every single cut? Yes, yes we are, because we want this to be as perfect as possible. Is it crazy? Yes, it is crazy. And you know, if it's a, like a little bit off, I'll accept it. We are going to caulk between the tongue and groove and the beam, and that's more for a paint aspect of it because, and I can walk you guys through this too when we get to the painting, we're gonna, this is already finished, like I was talking about. This is finished, we can put tape on it, it's a slick surface, so we'll tape the, the beam off when, when we spray this, and anytime you spray, you're gonna want a caulking there anyways to seal off your spray, because if you don't, it will drip, even behind frog tape. So that's, this is, I'm, I'm going into a whole nother video. So here, we got our setting right here, what we need to do now is we need to take our three inch piece that we ripped earlier and I've got this, this board up here. We'll take our three inch board, set it on that board and then we just set this on top of that and that zeroes both of these out. Then I can take my pencil, mark both sides of that, bam. That tells me exactly what cut I need to make here. So with those two scribe marks laid out, I can go ahead and just clamp my piece here. And then you can see I can line up right on my cut line and then go ahead and let it rip.
Repeat the process. And this piece should fit right in. That is freaking beautiful. So we're tight here. We're tight here. I'm not really worried about, I didn't, you know, if we we're on like a finished wall surface here, I probably would have back beveled that, that rip that we did to rip this to three inches. But I've got so much work to do to these walls. Okay, we try to do the pinch fit on the beams and we pinch this one way too hard. We damaged this thing really bad. So I'm, I, I have so much drywall to do here. This is gonna get cocked. This is gonna get all refloated out. This is gonna take a long time, so I don't wanna think about that. Let's do our next piece, and you guys can see how this thing starts, how it starts to look. I mean, it's gonna be amazing. Uh, we should probably install this one, though. So we're using 18 gauge brads, and we're doing a blind nail. So on our joist right here, that's our firing location to where we're gonna fasten these. And the blind nail is where we're shooting into the tongue, kind of at a slight angle. And that way we don't have to fill any nail holes. So I'll go right on my red line, give it a slight angle, send it. Same thing here, send it. So our first piece of tongue and groove is in. We've got five beams, that means we have six of these <laughs> locations to do this in. We're gonna be here for a very long time, but it's okay. Just, you gotta block that out. When you're doing carpentry, it's, it's a game of endurance. So we're gonna release our jig here, right? And then for this, we're gonna seat it this time. So again, we'll bring it in. You don't have to do it this exaggerated every time. I'm just kind of showing you guys. And we're gonna set this thing right where the V begins on our uh, piece that's already installed. So I got it there. I've got it pushed out to each beam and I'm gonna tighten it down. So I've got these tightened down. I can drop it back down. It's real important too that when you're moving this thing around, you don't like bump it on stuff. If you do like hit it on something, you will have to reset it, which is not a big deal. But you don't want to hit it on something, not notice, and then use that as your template for cutting your piece, because I've done that before on other jobs, and it's really sad. It's a waste of material. Mark. Mark on this side, of course. And this is going like, you're thinking like, this is psycho, dude. You're gonna have so many of these to do. It'll actually go a lot quicker with two people because it'll just be like a rotation of someone cutting, handing the board, and then the other guy handing the next guy the template. And we're hoping we can get a pretty good flow going. So we're good there. Line up on our cut, cut line. I like that. And then when I install these, I kind of like to tilt it. So I kind of give it like a little tilt like that. I find that the tongue and the groove are easier to kind of find where they're gonna go together. And then once I see that they're, they're going, of course I start uh, hitting it in. All right, I'm good on this side. All right. That looks good. And I'm gonna call that one good. So same thing, blind nail and blind nail. Dang, that looks good. Can you imagine when they're, <laughs> it's in between all of these beams. All right, let me do one more. We'll speed this up and um, I'll show you guys when I'm actually putting this in.
Guys, we are looking so good with this. All tight up against this, almost to the point where you wouldn't even need to caulk it. But as I mentioned earlier, to spray this and not have any overspray or drip come down your tape line, it has to be caulked. Even if it's like you have a 16th of an inch tape line, cut your caulking tube so thin and just barely just seal it off, push it in there. So it has nowhere to go essentially because it's real tight, but it will seal it off. So when you spray this and then you peel your masking off of this, I mean, it is crisp. We will get to that point. So let me put like a couple more of these in and then I want to tell you about why we did it this way versus putting all this on the ceiling first and then our beams. So now that we're at this point, I want you guys to come take a look at this. Like if you're standing right here looking at this, look how crispy that is right there. That is so nice. Any minor gaps are gonna get filled, but I mean, that looks so good. So here's one of the big reasons why we did not put this first. If you were to put this first, you would not have that beam inside that hole right there. Where basically where that chamfer profile is, you would have no beam there. So think about it like this. If, this, if we already had this on the ceiling and this is my beam material coming up, oh, you got a giant gap right there at that profile mark. I would much rather see between the V right here of this V groove beam in there. You say that's a crazy detail, who cares about that? I do, that too. <laughs> so this is another tedious thing. If you wanna talk about endurance and tedious things that carpenters and painters have to do, well, guess what now? Now when we mask off, we're gonna mask this off. We can run a straight tape line across our tongue and groove profile, but when we get to the V match right there, we're gonna have to rip two pieces of tape and make that, that 90 right there. Now that's crazy. And we're gonna do that. We're gonna be here, I'll probably spend one of my weekends just doing that. We have our first tongue and groove section complete. So the next section we're gonna start on is right here. We're already set up with the scaffold. We have three um, joists right here, so we will be shooting to all three of those. Some of them we have two, some of them we have three. Just depends, you know, where the joists are obviously on the ceiling. So yeah, we're gonna start on this next section and this thing, this really, it's gonna look so good. So once we got that first section done, we kind of had it figured out. I mean, there's really nothing to it. You're basically repeating the same process over and over and over and over. <laughs> Unfortunately, we couldn't work as fast as you see in our time lapse here. That would have been awesome. But since we did time lapse these sections, they did take us about one hour reviewing the footage. So a total of six of these, that uh, should be like a day's worth of work, six hours. Uh, but basically what you're seeing here is I am holding the template up like I was showing you guys and then I'm handing John that template and he's picking a board up, laying it on there, marking it and cutting it, handing it to me while I'm putting that piece in, I am giving it back to him. So basically, it's just a, a good rotation. We got it figured out. And like I said, an hour per section, I think that's pretty efficient. I mean, doing this alone, I would probably triple that. It'd probably take me like three hours. So really having the extra person made a huge difference. So hopefully you found this video useful if you're ever gonna install a material like this in between two finished materials where you need some pretty tight clearance or tolerance rather. So let me know if you guys have any questions about this and what I did, anything I could do better. And also let me know colors, like what color should we paint this? I like the white, especially when we have all the, you know, the prints from the factory, um, from the mill off there, you know, when we spray it. Uh, another option I was thinking was that Festool lime green. 